next witness. Dr. Shannon Curry. She'll come right now. Dr. Who? Shannon Curry. Can you, is it C-U-R-R-Y? C-U-R-R-Y, yes. Okay, thank you. swear or affirm to testify truthfully in this case under penalty of law. I do. Good morning, Dr. Curry. Good morning. I'm Wayne Dennison. Could you state your full name for the record? Shannon Curry. What do you do for a living? I am a clinical and forensic psychologist. What's your educational background? I received, well, I started college at Georgetown University. I then transferred to the University of California, Irvine, where I received my bachelor's degree in psychology and social behavior. I completed my master's degree in psychology at the uh, at Pepperdine University. I went on to complete my doctoral degree in clinical psychology at Pepperdine University, which included several training rotations at different practicum sites. Those are essentially clinical rotations we do to learn various types of psychology. You learn how to do psychological assessment, counseling, etc., and you do that in a variety of different settings. And then I completed a year-long doctoral internship at an American Psychological Association accredited uh, doctoral internship. You do this year before you get your degree. And that was at Tripler Army Medical Center. Um, it's traditionally a military internship. They did admit two civilians. I was lucky enough to be one of them. I then completed two years of postdoctoral training at Hawaii State Hospital, a locked forensic psychology facility, and uh, that's where you essentially have individuals with severe mental illness who have committed crimes. Have you done any additional uh, coursework or educational work? I have. So uh, after I completed my doctorate and my postdoctoral training, I obtained a, it's called a postdoctoral Master of Science degree in clinical psychopharmacology. Uh, that is uh, for partial fulfillment of prescription privileges, meaning that it's 
part of what we need to be able to prescribe medications as a psychologist, because psychologists don't traditionally prescribe, and we can do that with certain military jurisdictions and other states. Um, I also obtained um, advanced training in the Gottman method of couples therapy. Uh, I completed all three levels of training, and then I'm also a Gottman educator for several workshops involving uh, helping parents learn how to prepare to bring their baby home and uh, helping couples without serious problems improve their relationships. Uh, Eric, what's the Gottman method? The Gottman method is a highly research-based uh, method of couples therapy. It's very structured, so uh, different than what many people expect when they think about couples therapy. Uh, I always tell my clients I don't want them to come in just tell each other all their problems and then have an awkward, silent drive home. In this therapy, they come in, they complete a really structured assessment in the beginning. So they complete a bunch of questions. It gives me a ton of information about their relationship before we even get started and really identifies the areas we're gonna target with structured interventions during each session. I think of it almost like a class. Okay. Um, did you get in the course of your education, any specialized training? Any what? Specialized training? I did. So uh, my internship specifically was dedicated to um, essentially working with post-traumatic stress disorder, traumatic stress. Um, a lot of my training has been with psychological assessment and testing. And then my training during practicum and then in my postdoctoral work was dedicated to working with trauma populations and also conducting forensic psychological assessments. Oftentimes, um, forensic psychological assessments actually refers to doing testing and an interview and a couple other things for purposes related to law. So it's the application of psychology to the courts, to, to legal issues. Um, and sometimes that also involves uh, doing assessments for the military to determine whether somebody has sustained a mental disability after combat. Um, you indicated that uh, you did some work at Tripler. Uh, what's Tripler and, and what's the work you did? So Tripler Army Medical Center is a hospital in Honolulu, Hawaii. If anybody's ever gotten to have a vacation in Hawaii, it's a giant pink building there. And um, it's one of the top training sites for military psychologists. I was very, very lucky to be able to train there. They have wonderful funding and a lot of new research going on, particularly for PTSD, but really for all areas of mental health. While I was there, I did rotations in family psychology, so doing family th therapy. I worked with children, but I also did a neuropsychology rotation, learning really the ins and outs of advanced psychological assessment, um, identifying not just mental issues, mental sort of mental illness, but also traumatic brain injuries after trauma, and doing those PTSD evaluations, and then also working with service members who were struggling with a whole host of issues, military stressors, normal life stressors, and then also those who sustained tremendous uh, trauma from combat. Uh, do you still continue to work with the military? I do, actually. Our practice, I, my practice is very focused on military service members, veterans, and their families. Okay. Um, what work have you done uh, in prior uh, litigation matters? Well, uh, most of my litigation, if we're talking about civil work, that has mostly been reports. So this is my first time testifying in a civil matter. Uh, the majority of my forensic work has been in criminal law or providing psychological assessments, and then I produce a really methodical report um, which is typically reviewed by a judge, um, and a determination is made, or usually there's a settlement uh, beforehand. Okay. Uh, do you work uh, in connection with, with any particular courts? I do. So I, I'm actually not sure if I'm on the list anymore in Honolulu, but um, I am a certified forensic evaluator for the state of Hawaii, which means that um, I have been appointed by the court to conduct evaluations for matters that are presented. 
Uh, and then I'm also on um, the list of forensic evaluators in several courts in Southern California. Um, and then I'm also, I'm contracted by the military, the Department of Defense, uh, now and again for evaluations of PTSD from service members. Okay, you, you mentioned uh, PTSD a, a couple of times now. Yes. What are you referring to there? So PTSD is a mental illness. Um, it can develop after a person has been exposed to a traumatic event. And our diagnostic statistical manual, the DSM, is sort of the authoritative manual of mental illnesses. It, we, it's considered our Bible of mental illness. We go there for diagnoses. And according to that, there's a specific type of trauma that a person must experience for them to be able to qualify for a diagnosis of PTSD. And that's an event that is life-threatening. It can also involve sexual assault, and you can experience that either directly, but you can also be traumatized if you've seen it happen to somebody else, or if it's happened unexpectedly or violently to somebody close to you, a family member or a friend. Um, and then there's also a provision for people who are first responders, if they're encountering really traumatic information regularly, um, that qualifies as a trauma. Now, there are a number of symptoms that can develop. We'll, 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 sure. We'll talk about that some okay. more. Uh, do you hold any credentials relevant to the work that you do? Well, I am a licensed psychologist. Um, Where? In California and Hawaii. Okay. And any other certifications or other credentials? Not that I can think of off the top of my head other, other than the training with the Gottman Method of Couples Therapy. Okay. Have you worked with the Hawaii Department of Courts and Corrections? Yes, I have. In what capacity? Well, I am, I, so that I guess would be a credential. So I am a certified forensic evaluator for the state of Hawaii. In connection with your doctorate, was there a research component? There was. So uh, would you like me to tell you about it? Yes, please. OK. So I conducted a research study while I was at Pepperdine completing my doctorate. It's called a dissertation. So when you're obtaining your doctorate, you contribute something to the scientific field that you're in. And typically, that involves doing what we call novel science. So you're doing an experiment. You're finding out new information and helping the field progress. So I did research in Peru, and I was essentially looking at the effectiveness of a therapy intervention there for kids who were growing up in this community called Ayacucho, which was exposed to 20 years of guerrilla warfare, the longest guerrilla war in the history of the world. And uh, there were a lot of issues in that community, tremendous trauma. And my research was around uh, finding interventions that were really effective for that community. Where do you work now? I work for the Curry Psychology Group. Uh, what does the Curry Psychology Group do? We're a multi-specialty mental health center, so we have neuropsychologists who do testing for kids. We have therapists, individual therapists, couples therapists, family therapists. We even have a meditation teacher. We basically try to meet the needs of our community, and we highly specialize in working with military personnel and their families. Yeah. Who's the Curry in Curry Psychology Group? I, I'm Dr. Curry. <laughs> How many people work for you? As of right now, I believe it's 13. Okay. How long have you been doing this kind of work? For about 15 years. Right. How much of your therapy practice focuses on treating individuals? I would say about half of it is individuals, half is couples. OK. Do you do any training of students? I do. What's that? So uh, we have several unlicensed professionals at our office, and um, they're earning their additional hours so that they can get licensed. So they're able to see clients. And then I meet with them regularly to supervise them, discuss their cases, provide them with information about different diagnoses, interventions, and treatment mm -hmm. methods. How did you get involved in this case? I was contacted by Ms. Camille Vasquez, one of the attorneys for Mr. Depp. OK. And 
What was the nature of the contact? Ms. Vasquez called me and indicated um, that she might be interested in having me meet the legal team so that I could discuss my expertise and possibly provide my opinions related to the matter. Yeah. What were you asked to provide uh, expert opinion on? So initially, uh, my role that I understood at the time was to review the case materials and um, provide my opinions regarding anything that I noticed that was consistent or even inconsistent with the psychological science um, that exists today on intimate partner violence in Mr. Depp and Ms. Hurd's relationship. Okay. But, all right, you used a phrase there, uh, intimate partner violence. What are you talking about? So there are a multitude of different definitions depending on the source or the state. Uh, but essentially, intimate partner violence is abuse. It could be physical, psychological, uh, and it's from one partner to another in an intimate relationship. Okay. Um, did your role in this case evolve over time? Yes, uh, it shifted. So I was retained uh, in, at the end of January 2021, and then uh, had just barely begun to review the documents. The case was postponed, and then in October 2021, um, I was asked uh, by counsel to provide a psychological evaluation of Ms. Hurd. Okay. Did, uh, were you ever asked to do a uh, psycholo psychological evaluation of Mr. Depp? No. Okay. Uh, what types of documents did you consider in this analysis? So I reviewed uh, quite a few documents as part of my evaluation. That included um, all of the case documents, Ms. Hurd's uh, medical records by Dr. Kipper, her prior mental health treatment records. I believe I reviewed records from uh, Dr. Amy Banks, Dr. Bonnie Jacobs, Dr. Cohen, Connell Cohen, um, uh, and also a significant portion of my review involved uh, notes from nurse Erin Filotti at the time, Erin Borum, who spent a significant time with Ms. Hurd in her direct company. I also reviewed exhibits, um, quite a few audio recordings, a video recording, several video recordings or possibly photographs, I might be getting them confused, um, and multiple witness statements, testimony, and um, declarations. Did there come a time when you met directly with Ms. Hurd? Yes, I did. So in conducting my evaluation, I met with Ms. Hurd on two separate dates, December 10th and December 17th, 2021. Uh, approximately how much time have you spent with Ms. Hurd? So the evaluation, uh, we spent 12 hours directly with one another. Um, however, there were, more, there were more hours involved in the evaluation with some breaks. So we spent seven hours together on the first day, December 10th, um, not necessarily together because there was a one hour lunch break and about a half hour with breaks split up through the day. And then on the 17th, we spent a little more than eight hours in the evaluation from start to finish with a one hour break and another half hour of breaks distributed throughout the day. As, the, as a result of the work that you performed, did you form any opinions with respect to Ms. Hurd? I did. What were those opinions? I, uh, the results of Ms. Hurd's evaluation supported two diagnoses, borderline personality disorder and histrionic personality disorder. What is a diagnosis? A diagnosis is a way that we essentially, that psychologists, psychiatrists, anybody in the mental health field thinks about a disorder. It helps us to communicate a set of symptoms that a person is experiencing. And along with that set of symptoms, it, it tells other professionals a lot about how those symptoms might have developed, how that person might behave, perceive the world. Um, it also drives treatment. The real purpose is to determine what sort of in interventions will be most effective for the person. Yeah. Um, previously, you made reference to, uh, I think you called it the DSM-5. What's yes. that? So the DSM-5, that stands for the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, uh, version 5. And uh, that contains 
every diagnosis we use in mental health, and uh, we, it's, it's the authoritative manual of mental diagnoses. Is uh, performing diagnoses something you typically do in your line of work? Yes. Thank you. Um, so you referenced uh, two personality disorders. What's a personality disorder? To understand a personality disorder, I think it can be helpful first to kind of define personality. So personality, something we take for granted, but these are the traits, the characteristics, the way we think, we feel, and we act that make us who we are. And these traits are pretty stable over time and across situations. We might, uh, you know, be sure to mind our P's and Q's when we're meeting somebody new, but overall, if somebody were to describe us or if we were to describe ourselves, we have a pretty good sense of who we are. Um, sometimes an easy way to think of it is imagining how you might describe a brother or sister or a child if you have children. Their personalities are pretty clear to you. A personality disorder is some sort of dysfunction in those enduring traits. So as opposed to other types of mental illness, um, when you think about something like depression, that's episodic. It comes and it goes, and when it's treated with medication, it can pretty much be completely mitigated or minimized in a person's life, and their personality is still there, separate from the depression. When we have a personality disorder, there are going to be disturbances in several different areas that are visible in almost all different facets of their life. Is there a manner in which uh, personality disorders are commonly diagnosed? Yes, so they can be diagnosed in a treating environment. A uh, treating psychologist or a therapist or a psychiatrist simply does a diagnostic interview, which involves assessing multiple areas of a person's history back down through childhood. I'm going to stop you for a second. Yes. What's a treating environment? Oh, sometimes I'll slip into these words. I apologize. So a treating environment in therapy. If somebody is going in for treatment, um, the, psycho the mental health provider will ask them questions to find out what sort of symptoms they've experienced and what sort of things have occurred in their life that might be consistent with these disorders or rule out these disorders, prove that there's no reason for these disorders to be considered. They might also pay attention to their observations of the client over time and new information the client provides them. The most reliable way, however, to ever come about a diagnosis really is through a comprehensive psychological assessment. And I might use the words assessment, examination, testing interchangeably. They all mean the same thing. It's combining information from multiple different sources um, one main source is psychological testing using validated objective measures. That means that they've been tested, they've been shown to be accurate for testing what you want to test, and in the environment you're testing. So there are measures specific for court environments where someone might respond differently. You integrate that with the same interview I was telling you that people would do for therapy. We do that as well. And then in a courtroom setting, you're going to look at all the legal records, all of those documents, corroborating information to sort of check your hypotheses that may be developing and also check against the examinee statements to confirm whether you have enough evidence of a certain diagnosis. So what's a clinical interview? A clinical interview is a very comprehensive interview. It includes a person's entire life history. Um, as well as very specifically looks at any symptoms they might have. This can start as far back as birth. You might find out if there were any issues with their delivery, um, any uh, genetic issues, any intellectual issues. How did they do, what was their home life like? How was discipline handled? What's their relationship with their primary caregivers? Were they right, raised by an aunt, an uncle, their parents? How many siblings do they have? How do they get along with their siblings? How many times did they have to move? Were, was there any abuse? Did they have any really significant life experiences that come to mind when they think about their childhood? How were they as a student? Did they need special services? Did they get in trouble at school? And you do this, you continue on high school. What were their hobbies? Did they play sports? How many friends did they have? Did they have any trouble keeping those friendships? Then you get into adulthood. Did they go to college? Did they not go to college? How come? What sort of jobs have they held? How did those jobs go? How did they end? That's always an important question. 
What sort of romantic relationships have they been involved in? How do they identify sexually, culturally? Um, let's see, what else? What sort of symptoms have they experienced? Um, you go through the entire gamut of some of the main symptoms you might screen for depression, um, any disorganized thinking, that means thinking that isn't necessarily in touch with reality, and uh, any current distress they may be ha ha having today. How did you conclude that Ms. Heard su suffers from the personality disorders that you identified? So uh, there was information that supported it from multiple sources. Um, I conducted testing, including um, one of the main tests that I used. Uh, she obtained scores that were consistent with those diagnoses. And then I also, um, there was evidence of those diagnoses in her records and in her self-report. OK. All right, Council, why don't we just go ahead and pause for a second while we go ahead and take our morning recess. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we'll go ahead and take our 15 minute morning recess. Do not discuss the case and do not do any outside research, okay? Your Honor, when would you like to reconvene? Uh, give me a moment, sir. And doctor, since you're on the stand now, do not discuss your testimony with anybody to include the attorneys at this point, okay? okay. All right, let's go ahead and we'll come back at 11.45, okay? All right, thank, thank you. Thank And your next question, sir. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, but Dr. Curry, before the break, uh, you were talking about some of the uh, factors that you considered in determining uh, that Ms. Heard suffers from personality disorders. And mm -hmm. one of them, I think the last one you said before you left was self-report. What do you mean by that? So uh, the self-report would be things that Ms. Hurd indicated to me specifically. Um, so there were a couple of characteristics that she noted in her self-report that were consistent with these personality disorders. Um, the first was actually my own behavioral observations of her based on her self-report. So one of the hallmark characteristics of histrionic borderline, or sorry, histrionic personality disorder, is sort of a overly dramatic presentation. We call this impressionistic speech. So it tends to be very flowery. It uses a lot of descriptive words like magical, wonderful. And it can go on for quite some time, and yet it really lacks any substance. So at the end, you're left wondering what was just said or what the answer is to the actual question. So that occurred a number of times. Um, and it also represented the kind the quick shifts you'll see between emotions. So she would suddenly be one way and then she would become very animated or very um, uh, sad. And when people are displaying these emotions with this personality disorder, it, there's a sense of shallowness to it. People who are observing them will feel like uh, it's almost play acting, and they might not be able to put their finger on it. But part of it is because of the rapidness with which the person can switch emotions and also the lack of substance. They don't really refer to, I feel this way. They might describe emotions. They might describe events, but very rarely, and I misheard did not, say, I feel vulnerable. She never really indicated a vulnerable feeling of her own. Then the substance of her self-report. So when I was asking her information about her history. We're, we're going to uh, ask more about that later. I was just trying to get a sense of what a self-report was. Oh, OK. Um, what psychological tests did you perform? OK, so psychological tests, I, uh, I'll just go in order. So first of all, I asked her a couple questions from something called the mini mental status exam. That's really just a fancy way of saying that I wanted to make sure that she was alert and oriented to, we call it person, place, and time. That means she knew who she was, she knew who I was, she knew where we were, and she knew the date. That, make, that way I can ensure that she's able to participate in the evaluation and understand what's happening. I then um, administered something called the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory 2. The 2 means that it's the second edition. 
And this is something we call an objective measure. So um, it uh, asks 567 questions, more statements, and the person either agrees or disagrees with them, how much the statement represents them. And this test has been around since 1943. There are more than 10,000 studies showing that it is appropriate for determining somebody's personality traits. It measures all of those things I sort of mentioned, how a person thinks, feels, and behaves in multiple different aspects of their lives. It also measures very accurately um, any signs of mental illness or dysfunction. And the reason I also really like this test, whenever you're using a test for an evaluation that's gonna be used in a forensic setting, people have a lot of incentive to present themselves in a way that's gonna benefit their case. And they may want to look like they're sicker than they really are. They may want to look much healthier than they really are. And some of those um, incentives, they may not even realize that they're intending to do that. So it can be conscience, conscious or unconscious, but you really need to have a test that can check for that. And the MMPI-2 has a set of validity scales, we call them. These are scales that measure really the truthfulness and accuracy with which a person is approaching the test. And these, te these scales on this particular test have been so well researched over many decades that they've become very nuanced and they can tell us a lot about if somebody's, for instance, exaggerating, are they elevating one of the scales that shows that they're exaggerating on purpose? Are they exaggerating in a manner that's more like a cry for help? Are they exaggerating in a manner that's clever and sophisticated or more obvious? And then the same exact thing goes for trying to minimize symptoms. We have a number of scales that can show us all the different, if somebody's trying to say they're the most wonderful person on earth, or if they're just trying to deny problems, and if they're doing that again in a very clever way or more of an obvious way. So that test was my choice for this case. There's one other reason I'd like to add, is that part of my evaluation was, uh, one of the reasons was to assess whether Ms. Hurd has post-traumatic stress disorder, which I told you about earlier, um, as a result of the incidents that she's alleged occurred by Mr. Depp. And that's a really tough disorder to find out if somebody's faking it or not. It's one of the most easily faked disorders. Most of us know what it feels like to feel anxious. And a lot of people have seen war movies and movies that depict somebody having PTSD. And in fact, some research has shown that if you give someone a diagnostic checklist and said, show that you have PTSD, they can do it 96% of the time, just someone on the street. So you really need a test that's very sensitive to that. And the MMPI-2 has been shown in multiple studies to be excellent at detecting those attempts. Okay, you keep using MMPI-2, that's the abbreviation that you folks use for? The, I'm sorry if I hadn't said that. That's the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Okay. Uh, what other uh, psychological testing did you perform? So I also performed the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, Dash 5, and that Dash 5 links it to the diagnosis for PTSD in our current diagnostic manual, the fifth version. Um, to do that test, you first administer something called the Life Events Checklist. And the Life Events Checklist, both of these tests, by the way, were the, developed by the National Center for PTSD with the Department of Veterans Affairs. But the Life Events Checklist lists 16 different very stressful life events that people can go through that are often can be associated with developing PTSD. And then it also has a 17th item that you can fill in if you feel like you've been through something really difficult that wasn't included. Now, I like to also add something called the Life Events Checklist 5 interview, which digs a little bit deeper into the person's childhood as well to find out if they, what sort of, there's so many different things that can be difficult growing up. And also, it's very important that you have the person determine which of the events they've listed, let's say they have a number of different types of traumas, which one do they feel like was the most traumatic for them? Which one still causes them to feel distressed when they talk about it? And sometimes they can't just identify one. And then that, has a, that leads to your next decision. So if they have multiple different similar types of events, like seeing combat, 
then you might use that as the worst one, the multiple similar. So that looks like uh, you describe an anchor, we call it, to do the testing, and we would maybe describe the anchor as the worst of my combat experience, okay? Now, if somebody had multiple different traumas from different times in their life, like childhood abuse, and then went to combat and had some horrible things happen there, you would do the clinician-administered PTSD scale test, the one that comes after, you do one for the childhood event and a separate one for the adulthood event. Does this clinician-administered PTSD scale have a handy abbreviation? It does. <laughs> okay. We'll call it the CAPS-5. That, that's actually what it goes by. Okay. Um, how common is the use of the MPPI, MMPI-2 in your profession? The MMPI-2 is actually the most commonly used assessment worldwide by mental health professionals and in forensic settings for the court. Why do you use it? I used it for that purpose and for its excellent validity in those settings across genders, across ethnicities, um, for different reasons. And um, when I keep saying validity, by the way, what I mean is accuracy, or, uh, and I'll try to work that in but then also for detecting the accuracy with which a person reports PTSD. Okay. Um, is that scaled in some way? I'm sorry, what was that? Do, does that make use of a scale in some way? The MMPI-2, do you mean specifically for PTSD? Yes. There's actually a combination of scales you wanna look for. You would never make the diagnosis just based on one scale alone, or even on the test alone, you'd integrate other data. How did you administer the MMPI-2 to Ms. Hurd? I provided her the test on an iPad. She essentially had her own little desk area and then an iPad. She hits start, it provides her with the instructions and then the, it gives her 567 statements in order. For each one, she taps true or false. What did you learn about Ms. Hurd from the results of the MMPI-2? Quite a bit. I, um, I wrote up a 25-page interpretation outline. Um, it has numerous, numerous scales. So one of the reasons I like this measure so much is that it can tell you so much about multiple different traits and tendencies and mental issues. Um, one of the primary things I learned was that um, she had a very uh, sophisticated way of minimizing any personal problems. Um, I also learned that she tends to, uh, well, there were a number of characteristics that were consistent with the eventual diagnoses, but um, some of the primary characteristics, and I'm going to try to condense 25 pages here, were essentially um, externalization of blame, uh, tending to have a lot of inner hostility that is attempted to be controlled. Um, a tendency to be very self-righteous, but to also deny that self-righteousness and to judge others um, critically uh, against these sort of high standards for moral value, but also to deny doing that. Essentially to, to claim that one is uh, uh, very non-judgmental and accepting and yet very full of rage, really. And, um, and these aren't facts, but it, her scores essentially correlated so they were consistent with other people who obtain these scores who have been shown through many, many, many studies to have these very specific traits. So externalization of blame, um, a lot of inner anger and hostility, sometimes that anger among these groups with similar scores, these people might have that anger kind of explode out at times. They tend to be very passive aggressive. They may be self-indulgent, very self-centered. Um, they uh, could use manipulation tactics to try to get their needs met, very needy of attention, acceptance, approval. Um, they tend to uh, distance people who are close to them. Initially, they may seem very charming. They're very socially sophisticated, actually. That was a major component on there. Um, they have a capacity to kind of offer some of their faults, but uh, in a way, but only the ones that people think of lightly and can all relate to. 
And so they can present as very fair and balanced, but in actuality, they really might uh, uh, be very judgmental of others and unaware of problems in their behavior and their thinking. So after you uh, provide the, the examination via, via the iPad, what do you do? So once they've completed the test, you can have it scored by the computer immediately. Um, it's a very, very complex test to interpret, but right away you get a list of what's called critical items. And these are just some, uh, a couple of the items, the statements that are presented that are more um, clearly symptom-based. And I always follow up with the examinee. Some of these might have to do with suicide. Some of them might have to do with other symptoms that you just like to get a little bit more information on because sometimes an examinee might tell you they're completely fine when you're doing your interview with them and that they have no symptoms. And then when they take the test, it says that they're having trouble sleeping or they struggle with nausea all the time or they feel very anxious. And so you, you wanna follow up on that. Okay. Uh, what's a code type? A code type, let me uh, think of how to explain this very, very simply. So the main scales, and I keep referring to scales, these are just uh, the main scores that come up on this test we um, can refer to them as codes. And when I was saying that Ms. Hurd's scores could be compared to certain groups of people that had been researched before to obtain similar scores, the research has shown that certain people will have certain scores that kind of spike on this, okay? And so all of those traits that I were descri was describing, those are traits that are found in these code types. So it means that number two, score number two was high, and score number six was high. And so if we have those two scores were both high, then that's a two six code type. And what these code, code types- type, What code type was Ms. Heard? Ms. Heard had the clearest code type was three six, but then she also had some other code types that were less significant. What characteristics are associated with a three six code type? So a 3-6 code type, a lot of that anger is expressed in this code type. Um, there can be actually a lot of cruelty, uh, usually with people who are less powerful. Uh, actually, when you see this code type, you want to, if you can, to follow up with subordinates, coworkers, people who may have observed their behavior more closely. The 3-6 code type is very concerned with their image, um, very attention-seeking. Uh, very prone to externalizing blame to a point where uh, it's unclear whether they can even admit to themselves that they do have responsibility in certain areas. A uh, lot of suppressed and denied anger, but the anger is very present, will explode out, and a lot of issues in their close relationships. How does Ms. Hurt's code type uh, fit in with your overall opinion as to personality disorders? Well, um, this might be an appropriate time to describe a little bit about these personality disorders because I think what you'll hear is that there's a lot of consistency there. Uh, so borderline personality disorder is a disorder of stability. It's instability, and it's instability in personal relationships. It's instability in their emotions. It's instability in their behavior and it's instability in their sense of self and their identity. And that instability is really driven by this underlying terror of abandonment. So one of the key features also of this disorder, and you, you, all of it is like pistons of an engine kind of firing off and igniting one another. But when somebody is afraid of being abandoned by their partner or by anybody else in their environment and they have this disorder, they'll make desperate attempts to prevent that from happening. And those desperate attempts could be physical aggression, it could be threatening, it could be harming themselves. But these are behaviors that are usually very extreme and very concerning to the people around them. Um, uh, the anger is typically what, sadly, it's counteractive, right? So the thing these people fear most is being abandoned, but over time, the anger, the explosive anger that they show when somebody is 
needing space or when somebody is really not doing anything wrong because a lot of times they read into things that they perceive as being a slight to them or being somebody intending to harm them that actually isn't happening. They'll exaggerate it um, and they'll explode. They'll react in this heightened manner that is just exhausting for their partners. Oftentimes their partners will uh, try to make them happy at first and really allow themselves to be a punching bag thinking that they can somehow solve this problem, that uh, somehow they can make this better and eventually it just overwhelms them. Histrionic personality disorder is well, very Before similar. we move on. To okay. That, um, are you familiar with the term emotional reactivity? I am. What is that? So emotional reactivity is very common in the diagnosis. So essentially, uh, like I said, there's instability in emotions. People with borderline personality disorder are often misdiagnosed as having bipolar disorder because they can be up and down. They can look very depressed then they can look very elated. But these changes are happening within a matter of hours. Somebody with bipolar disorder, these are, this is a clinical depression lasting days, weeks, a clinical mania where sometimes they even need to be hospitalized because they're so grandiose. They clear out their bank account and go to Vegas and spend it all. They're acting in some very bizarre ways. With uh, borderline personality disorder, you're having these fluctuating moods constantly. And again, this hypersensitivity to being slighted or feeling offended, really driven by the fear that if you're offended or slighted, if the therapist comes in two minutes late, or if somebody shows up to dinner two minutes late, that they might be abandoning you. And it's not as if the borderline is considering themselves abandoned in that moment, but they just know that they have this overwhelming emotion and there are no attempts to control that emotion. There's no, there are no attempts to regulate it. So if they're in the middle of the restaurant and they feel offended, they're gonna start the fight. Uh, people are going to see it or they might just start crying or break down, but they'll make a lot of accusations and that reactivity is when you're going to just you're going to see a lot of this escalation in the bizarre behavior. They can react violently. They can react aggressively. They will often physically prevent their partner from trying to leave if their partner wants to get space from all of this intense emotion. And oftentimes they will uh, be abusive to their partners in these situations. Sometimes they'll physically restrain them from leaving and become injured that way. But also. People with borderline personality disorder, it seems to be a predictive factor for women who implement violence against their partner. And one of the most common tactics that they'll use is actually physically assaulting and then getting harmed themselves. But mostly, um, we call this administrative violence. So essentially, this is saying that they'll make threats using the legal system. So. Um, they might say that they are going to file a restraining order or claim abuse, or they might do these things to essentially try to keep their partner from leaving. In the moment, again, they're not consciously thinking, I'm gonna keep my partner from leaving right now. They're just thinking, I can't stand this. I hate my partner. They went from idealizing to suddenly devaluing because of the hurt, and they'll do anything to express that big emotion of anger. Your Honor, may we approach? All right, yes, sir. Okay, um, you indicated uh, 
you were talking about emotional reactivity. Uh, what, if any, emotional reactivity did you uh, observe in your review? And let's do this one at a time. Okay. So there were uh, a couple indications to me. Uh, first, uh, I can sort of think about it with the treatment records. So particularly uh, Dr. Um, Cohen Connell's, am I getting the name right? I feel like for some reason in my mind, I might have just reversed it. Uh, but Dr. Cohen's records, <laughs> I did reverse it. Uh, he actually refers to this reactivity quite a bit and to Ms. Hurd's temper. And that, that temper, it's often branded, or being hot-headed, is really characteristic of uh, borderline personality disorder, um, as is their ch very charming, personable nature. It's, it's, this is a disorder of contradictions. Uh, in Nurse Filotti's notes, um, she had, I thought there was something interesting. She references a night when they're out to dinner, I believe in London, and she provided positive reinforcement to Ms. Hurd because Ms. Hurd had been uh, disappointed by a mistake made by the server, and it sort of references how previously she might have criticized the server or be become upset by that, um, and that she didn't this time, and so that that had been some uh, sort of a, a step forward. Uh, And uh, there was also an indication, actually, in Dr. Hughes's. Uh, Dr. Hughes is a forensic psychologist who had been appointed by Ms. Hurd to conduct as an evaluation as well. In Ms. Hughes's interview of Ms. Hurd, Ms. Hurd disclosed that she had cut her arm in the past, which is a typical reactive type thing somebody with this diagnosis can do. It's one of the symptoms. Um, and that's sort of all I can think of top of my mind from the treatment records. Moving into um, some of the declarations um, or deposition testimony, what struck me was Ms. Raquel Pennington's testimony. Um, she's a former friend of Ms. Hurd's, and she indicated, she told a story about, I suppose they were shopping for Thanksgiving accoutrements, something to prepare for Thanksgiving, and Ms. Hurd struck her in the face, sort of out of the blue, um, which is, I, I thought was interesting because that is one of those signs of borderline personality disorder where if a, if a friend or a loved one isn't meeting your needs in that moment, um, borderline people with borderline personality disorder can be very caring in their relationships as long as their needs are being met, they feel that their needs should be met when they want them met um, at a specific level and if they're not, then that anger, that sense of harm causes them to react. So the striking Ms. Pennington per Ms. Pennington's report in the declaration or the testimony I thought was pretty consistent. And then uh, Ms. Hurd's own self-descriptions. Uh, okay, we're okay. gonna, um, I'm gonna ask you a question about, sure. um, you indicated Ms. Pennington uh, was a former friend of, yes. of Ms. Hurd. Is there uh, a relationship between borderline personality disorder and uh, intimate relationships? Yes, so, uh, so the instability definitely translates to their relationships. You'll see relationships start very intensely. People will, uh, somebody with borderline personality disorder perceives the relationship as extremely close. This pattern of idealizing and devaluing is definitely at play. They do this with their lovers and also with their friends. And so this might be the perfect person, their perfect soulmate friend, perfect soulmate partner, and their engagement in the relationship is very alluring, very charming to the other person. Um, and so initially everything seems great, but what occurs is that reality sets in. People are not perfect, even when we have a lot of in common with them. Um, Whereas most of us can accept somebody as a whole, somebody who has a little bit of flaws and still think this is my great friend who is all constantly running late for dinner. The person with borderline personality disorder, things are in these extremes, this black and white, we call it splitting. And so that person goes from being idealized, the perfect person, to dumpster. They are totally devalued. They are the worst friend. They don't care anything about me. I have better people around. 
And then there will be a repair because the person with this disorder does feel remorseful after they have these reactions, angry, tell their friend off. But over time, it wears away at these relationships. And so what you'll usually see is many, many transitions in their friendships over the years, people who have sort of fallen by the wayside, who were really very close-knit at one time, and then, but there's not a lot of consistency in the long term. You'll also see that with their intimate relationships, many, many relationships, but none that are particularly long-term. Uh, how does borderline personality disorder relate to identity issues? So again, that instability also travels toward identity. And when I was describing personality earlier, I was talking a little bit about those traits we have that help us know who we are. When you have borderline personality disorder, that actually is not something you understand. So uh, people with this disorder actually take on the identity of the people they're spending time with because it's comforting. It's very uncomfortable to not know who you are. Some people with this disorder will describe a feeling of emptiness when they feel like they've been abandoned because now they don't know who they are in the world. And so when somebody with this disorder is going through that initial enmeshment phase with new people and they're idealizing them, they often will take on the identities of those people. So they may mimic them in a lot of ways. They might mimic the way they dress, their interests, the way they talk. Um, and for this reason, the people around somebody with this disorder kind of from the outside may feel like, wait, I thought you were this way, now you're advocating for this, and this is your new main interest in life, or the thing you're throwing yourself into all completely. Music tastes might change, hobbies will change, the way they dress. Okay. Um, in addition to borderline personality disorder, I understand that you uh, diagnosed a, another personality disorder. What's that? So histrionic personality disorder, and these are really two sides of the same coin. Um, they belong to the same cluster. We call these clusters. It's a way to organize personality disorders in that DSM. And this cluster is described as the personality disorders that are dramatic, erratic, and emotional. Okay, so unpredictable, but really having to do with emotions and relationships. They're very similar. Whereas I was saying that borderline personality disorder, a lot of the key features that you're gonna notice are instability. When it comes to histrionic, a lot of the key features are going to be drama and shallowness. Similarly, with borderline personality disorder, there's this, under, uh, this underlying drive of avoiding abandonment. With histrionic personality disorder, that underlying drive is to always be the center of attention because if you don't have that attention on you, it feels similarly to borderline personality disorder. You feel pretty empty. Like you don't have that sense of being or of value, okay? So whereas borderline personality disorder might have more of the visible reactivity if somebody seems to be leaving, with histrionic personality disorder, what you're going to see is extreme discomfort with not being the center of attention, extreme efforts to be the center of attention, and when they feel that they're not the center of attention, you will see some strange things, making up stories to try to get attention, often taking on a victim or princess role, those two roles in particular are pretty consistent, seeking caretaking. Borderline personality disorder is similar because with borderline personality disorder, these shifts of identity and the splitting, you might see somebody go from being in the DSM, it describes it as a needy supplicant of help, seeking the perfect caretaker, to suddenly being the avenger against injustice or thinking that their partner is a terrible person. With histrionic, what you'll see is somebody who um, wants to be the center of attention has sort of that impressionistic speech, very flowerly, uh, very enthusiastic, but nothing's really being said. The moment your attention wears away because they're so demanding for attention, that's when they might take the victim role or the princess role and even make up stories. Sometimes those stories are to bolster the victim role. 
sometimes those stories are just to make them look more interesting or accomplished in their mind so that they can get respect and attention that way. Is there a relation between histrionic personality disorder and attractiveness? Attractiveness? <laughs> there is, strangely, and this is always one of the trickiest things to talk about. You, I mean, how is that a symptom? But characteristically, people with this disorder are very, very interested in looks, um, but more importantly, they utilize their looks to get that attention, to get that respect that they're seeking. And so this type of a personality might be flirtatious with everybody. Um, characteristically, they actually couldn't even be subtly, and when I say flirtatious, I'm not talking overtly sexy, but uh, kind of inappropriately flattering. Sometimes they act in a kind of a girlish way to be cute and to gender attention. And this will even occur in their therapy relationships as a way to sort of avoid getting negative feedback or criticism. Oftentimes they'll bring the therapist gifts or be distracting um, if they engage in therapy uh, because they just don't want any criticism. They want the therapist to like them. Does the intelligence of the affected person bear on the manner in which these disorders present? Excuse me, I choked a little of my water. Uh, it, yes, and I think one way to think about it that's probably a little more accurate than just intelligence is in psychology we would describe this more as sophistication. So street smart, so to speak. Um, the way, for instance, I've had many clients who have borderline personality disorder who are um, messy and really clearly suffering. And um, they might be difficult and all over the place and yell at you in the middle of session, but it's so, uh, uh, it's not tailored. It's so much easier to work with because of that just openness and rawness of it, genuineness. Sometimes you'll have a more sophisticated presentation. There are nine symptoms and only five have to be met. So there are a lot of different combinations and different ways it, it can present. And sometimes you'll have more of a petulant version of this where it really shows when you push the button and you're kind of, whoa, what was that? So somebody who's really productive, high functioning, successful, and you get to know them and you think they're fantastic because they're so interested in you too. And you might not realize it, but they're mimicking you perfectly. So you're really just kind of falling in love with this new friend who is being you. Um, but then all of a sudden, uh, you know, you say something that they think is offensive and you can't, in, even in your wildest thoughts, understand how that could have offended somebody, but their reaction is so strong that you kind of buy into it, gosh, maybe I did say something offensive and, and you feel bad about it. So that sophisticated version, they can be a little bit more calculated in the way they present. They tend to kind of hit you where it hurts a little bit more. And they can be actually very, very destructive. What conclusions were you able to draw about Ms. Hurd's sophistication from her testing? Well, from her testing and from her presentation, she's, she was very likable. But her testing in particular um, showed that she approached it in a manner that, uh, remember I told you about those, those scales that are pretty neat. Um, she approached it in a manner that very clearly minimized any psychological dysfunction. Um, not just that, but really presented herself as free of any problems. And she did so in a way that was very, um, very sophisticated, not obvious. Um, by responding to questions that most people might not notice would, were trying to detect that. Uh, how did you determine that? So that's based on a particular scale on the MMPI-2 that is designed specifically to detect a type of responding that's a little bit more clever, a little bit more sophisticated, minimizing problems in a way that most lay people probably wouldn't understand, and even providers, very difficult to detect. You mentioned that one of the characteristics of borderline personality disorder is emotional reactivity. How might that 
present in an intimate relationship? So I, I think it probably presents mostly, uh, or you'd see the bulk of it in intimate relationships because of that regular interaction and the desire for your partner to meet all of your needs, to be the perfect caretaker. Also that um, the hallmark of the disorder with the splitting, so idealizing, devaluing, and the perceiving of all sorts of neutral events as somehow demeaning or disrespectful. Um, it's regular escalations of anger, frustrated complaints, criticisms of your partner. But because the person with borderline personality disorder, first of all, they're more sensitive to things, they feel distress more strongly, and then that distress lasts longer. So these types of blow-ups go on forever and they're very cyclic it feels like you just can't get a resolution and eventually the partner will try to leave will want to leave to take a break it wears them down and that's when the borderline might explode and act very aggressively or violently to try to prevent them from leaving okay. in addition to uh, diagnosing misheard with uh, these two personality disorders. Um, did you form another, uh, another opinion about Ms. Hurd's mental status? Yes, so an, an, uh, there, uh, go ahead. If the answer to that is yes, I'm gonna th now ask you okay, what Okay, yes, that? I did. Okay, what is it? So uh, in addition to looking for Ms. Hurd's general mental status, any psychological issues that were present, I very specifically um, was assessing to determine whether post-traumatic stress disorder was present, and it was not. How do you know that? So first of all, from, uh, well, from multiple information sources, right? So I was integrating the interview, my review of the data, the case records, other people's testimony, her treatment records. And then I also conducted, in addition to the MMPI-2 and looking at that data, I also conducted uh, the clinician administered PTSD scale, the CAPS-5, which is the gold standard PTSD assessment um, developed by the National Center for PTSD, shown to be valid, accurate for use, not just with service members, but also with civilians, men, women, all genders, um, and also all ethnicities, and then also specifically for use in a courtroom setting. How do you conduct the CAPS-5? So the CAPS-5 is a standard interview. What that means is that it's an interview with very clear questions that are scripted, and you ask those same questions every time you test a person. So because you're doing that, you're actually taking something that would typically be kind of subjective, an interview with somebody, and you're making it more objective. When you ask those same questions in the same way, every time somebody's assessed with this, now you can apply a scoring protocol and actually score their responses. Okay. As a result of applying those protocols, what did you conclude? Ms. Hurd did not have PTSD, and there were also pretty significant indications that she was grossly exaggerating symptoms of PTSD when asked about them. How did you make that latter conclusion? So one of the strengths of this test, as I mentioned, the important thing about any test used when you're doing an evaluation in forensics is to make sure that the person is responding accurately. And this test does that by not just asking people whether they have a symptom, but asking follow-up questions that draw out very detailed accounts of every single symptom of PTSD. And when you're really familiar with this disorder, which you need to be to administer this test, there are nuances in the way a person will describe their symptoms that have been shown repeatedly to indicate exaggeration or faking. There are also indications when somebody is clearly giving you a genuine response. Okay. What, if any, symptoms of PTSD did you observe and misheard? So um, there are 20 kind of core symptoms that somebody might can manifest with PTSD. You don't have to have all of them. Um, Ms. Hurd initially said that she had 
in the first question you say, do you ever have this, before you get to the more nuanced follow-up questions. When I asked that first question on each item, she initially said, yes, I have that, to 19 of the 20 symptoms. That's not typical even of somebody with the most disabling form of PTSD. When we eventually sort of dialed it down, she had three remaining symptoms. And having symptoms of any disorder is common for all of us. Some of us struggle with sleep. Some of us get anxious. Um, it could be several different disorders. It could just be that you have this struggle in your life. But she had three specific symptoms that I scored as present. Um, off the top of my head, I might miss one, but one was sleep disturbance. So um, she reported that she has frequent nightmares. Um, another one was that she said that she tends to have a startle response. So if she gets startled or surprised, um, she tends to stay in sort of a hyper startle mode for quite a while. And that's consistent with a couple of things. It can be consistent with PTSD if other criteria are met. It's also consistent with childhood complex trauma, which is something that can occur when your brain is forming. If you constantly feel unsafe, if your parents are abusive, um, or if they're not present, if you're neglected, you can develop certain physiological responses that can stay for a long time in your life. So I, I noted that that was, seemed like a, a very genuine, accurate account where she stays in the state of kind of hyper arousal, has a hard time calming down if she gets surprised. You, um, mentioned, you mentioned nightmares as well. Yes. Did she recount for you the, the nature of the nightmares? So they were vague. Uh, she indicated that uh, she has recurrent nightmares and that she feels as though she's being held down. Um, in there, there was some conflict in that account because even though that could be a PTSD symptom, it is, it is fairly vague, but I still scored it as present. And in her initial treatment with Ms., or with, I'm sorry, with Dr. Bonnie Jacobs, uh, which I believe started before she began dating Mr. Depp, she had indicated to Dr. Jacobs, according to Dr. Jacobs' notes, that she was having repetitive nightmares back then and that they were related to her childhood trauma. Um, and so that came up several times in the notes. Dr. Jacobs kept mentioning that. Thank you. What is feigning? Feigning is essentially faking or exaggerating uh, symptoms that aren't present. Does the CAPS-5 control for that? It doesn't necessarily control for it. It can expose it and by drawing out that, the, How does that work? Because you're not just simply handing the person a checklist that says, here are all the symptoms of PTSD. Why don't just check off the ones you have, which clearly if you're trying to look like you have PTSD, you would just check them all. The CAPS-5, because it requires them to describe in detail how they experience the symptom, where it shows up, what it looks like, what sort of examples they can give you, how many times it's happened in the last couple of weeks, how many times it's happened in the last month. By the end of each symptom, you've gotten a very good picture of a couple of things. One, does it meet the definition of the symptom? Are they getting it right, right? Is this actually the symptom or are they kind of confusing this with something else? Number two, are they giving you very vague accounts um, are they giving you kind of a stereotyped idea of what the symptom is based on media or movies or something that actually is completely different from genuine experiences of this symptom? Or are they giving you a very genuine, heartfelt, sometimes minimizing, but it's, it's ticking all the boxes, their mannerisms while they're describing it, the uh, actual very specific, very nuanced, symbolic ways they're describing it. A lot of times um, it smells, it sounds. That all appears in genuine accounts and it's something that people really get wrong when they're feigning. Um, in addition to the, your conclusion that uh, Ms. Hurd does not have PTSD, did you make a conclusion with respect to her symptoms? Uh, yes, actually I did. So. Uh, you know, just because somebody doesn't have PTSD doesn't mean that they weren't harmed psychologically by 
whatever is being alleged, in this case, Ms. Hurd is alleging that she was psychologically harmed and that she suffered PTSD because of abuse that she alleges occurred by Mr. Depp. So I also, the MMPI-2 is helpful because it shows you kind of everything, any other symptoms. And then in Ms. Hurd's own self-report and her prior treatment records, I knew that she had uh, reported to me that uh, she had had some other symptoms. So now what becomes really important is determining, and let me clarify one thing here, not so much a diagnosis, but did she start to experience symptoms during the relationship and after? Did they worsen after? Or could these types of symptoms or reports be explained by other factors? A, by feigning, B, by pre-existing conditions, or C, by other stressful life events that might have occurred. So the main symptoms that I was looking at didn't meet criteria for PTSD, right? There was also um, you know, substantial evidence of this sort of emotional dysregulation, emotional disorganization, the shallowness, the dramatic affect. Now, when you have a lot of childhood trauma, you can actually have some similar type presentation in adulthood. There are some differences though, but also that's not something that would have occurred after this relationship. So now I was looking at, are there indications that these types of things that she's described this transient anxiety, the issues with sleep, were these there prior? And sure enough, um, Ms. Hurd, in her own self-report, stated to me that when she first got to LA, she was seeking treatment for, in her words, blanket anxiety and depression. Um, she also reported that she was taking medications. In general, none of them were helpful. That's actually very typical of borderline personality disorder. Medications typically aren't very helpful for somebody with a disorder. They really need an intensive, lifelong type of therapy, which is not necessarily as relevant to this. Um, but interestingly also, people with borderline personality disorder often respond really positively to um, stimulant medications that are uh, given for ADD or ADHD. And in one of Nurse Filotti's notes, she reported that Ms. Hurd told her that none of the medications were working for her except for one provisional, which is often prescribed as a stimulant medication. And I just thought that was interesting and sort of consistent with more of these lifelong personality disorders that aren't necessarily caused by a harm by any allegations, but have been there and will remain there typically. The other uh, issue, you know, so the anxiety, she had already indicated that it, that had been there prior, but the form of the anxiety. So looking at Dr. Hughes's testing and then also looking at the scores on the MMPI, when you look at all these little combinations of the scores, you can actually learn a lot about, is the anxiety related to an event or is this more a person who tends to be an anxious person regardless of what's going on in their life. And somebody might describe them as a worry wart. And the scores, the little combination of scores that she obtained actually indicated that it was the latter, that her anxiety tends to be separate from events and more just kind of a constant and it comes and goes, but it, it's more of a trait. I have no further questions for this witness. All right. Maybe we, why don't we go ahead and, uh, Ms. Brennan, go ahead and have our lunch break. It might be a good idea to, to break it up there. Okay, I know. I can see you jumping up. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take our lunch recess. Just again, do not do any outside research and don't discuss the case with anybody, okay? And we'll have you back here. And again, Dr. Curry, since you're in the middle of your testimony, please do not discuss your testimony with anybody at this time, okay? All right, let's just, while we come back at 150, okay? Come back at 150? All right, thank you. All right, cross-examination, you can sit down, ma'am. Okay. Thank you, Ron. <clears throat> Dr. Curry, you're not board certified, correct? No, I'm not. Not in clinical psychology or in forensic psychology, correct? No, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. But you're not board certified? No. Okay. And you also have only been practicing approximately eight years, is that correct? 
That's not correct. How many years? I've been licensed for 10 years, okay. and I've been practicing for about 15 years. Okay, and that includes what you went through with your different trials in Hawaii and everything else that you testified to, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, you went to Mr. Depp's home for dinner and drinks before you were hired as an expert in this case, correct? That's not quite what, right. I was interviewed at Mr. Depp's home by his legal team. Dinner was served. You, in attendance with Mr. Depp, was Adam Waldman, correct? Yes. Ben Chu, correct? Yes. Camille Vasquez? Yes. Okay. And the dinner lasted approximately three to four hours, correct? Yes. And it included the interview. drinks, correct? Yes. Dinner and I believe drinks were served. Okay. And this was before you were hired as an expert, correct? Yes. This was an interview so that they could make an informed decision as to whether or not to retain me. And don't you think that's a little odd that you're getting interviewed by Mr. Depp? to decide whether you're going to testify adversely against Amber Heard? I was interviewed by the legal team. And Mr. Depp was present. It was his home, correct? Yes. And he was serving dinner and drinks. He correct? was not serving dinner and well, drinks. Well, it was at his house at his behest, correct? Yes, it was at his house. Okay. And you were contacted by Camille Vasquez, somebody you knew in the community in February of 2020. Is that correct? I knew of Ms. Vasquez professionally. We live in the same city and I work with many attorneys. Okay. And at that time, you not only knew Johnny Depp, you'd seen a number of his TV and movie roles and you believed he was a good actor, correct? Not correct. I did not know Johnny Depp. Well, I had you seen knew several of, of his movies. You knew who he was? Yes. Right. And you believed he was a good actor? Correct? Yes. Okay. And then you provided an expert designation in this case before ever seeing Amber or having an opportunity to review any documents or records. Isn't that correct? I did not provide an expert designation. That's, that's an attorney thing. My opinions are contained in my report. Let's pull up plaintiff's exhibit 884, please. This was plaintiff's designation, identification of expert witnesses in this case. And this is dated February 2021. That's a, a year after you went to dinner at Mr. Depp's house, correct? Yes. Okay. And it attributes, if you go to page 13, it says you have three opinions. The first of those is that Amber Heard, quote, exhibits patterns of behavior that are consistent with co-occurring cluster B personality disorder traits, especially borderline personality disorder. Did I get that right? I'm reading that here. That is not my opinion. Okay. Well, but it's, it's a, a current opinion, but this was not an opinion of mine then. I didn't have any opinions at that time. It says Dr. Curry will testify, correct? That's what it says, yes. Okay. And this is a signed pleading, correct? on behalf of Mr. Depp. I, I'm not sure I understand what that means. What, you don't understand what a signed pleading is? No. Okay. Do you understand that Mr. Depp's counsel prepared this and served it on Ms. Hurd's counsel? I, I'm not an attorney. I don't understand necessarily all of these procedures. Okay. Are you aware that Mr. Depp is on an audio recording years earlier taunting Amber Heard that she has a borderline personality disorder? I was made aware of that in this case, yes. So you heard, did, did Actually, that one of the audio not necessarily taunting, to? but I do recall hearing that Mr. Depp had used that phrase. So it's a coincidence that you now think she has those attributes after the attorneys listed it in February 2021 before you'd looked at anything, and Mr. Depp had made that accusation to Ms. Heard years earlier. My opinions aren't based uh, it's on coincidence. It's an objection. Okay. I'm sorry, Dr. Okay. Rich. Yes. Compound, I'll sustain the objection. All right. It's a coincidence, then, that you came up with symptoms of borderline personality disorder years later after Mr. Depp has been taunting Ms. Heard in an audio tape. I can't them. speak to whether or not there's a coincidence. What I can tell you is my opinions are based on the results of my evaluation. And it's a coincidence that 
Mr. Depp's counsel attributed that to you, that said that to you in February 2021 before you'd looked at anything, correct? I'm not sure. Okay. Now, would you agree that a disproportionate number of women are tagged with a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder? No, that's not quite right. 75%? The way you phrased it is not quite right. Tell me, tell me what's right. Okay, so there are more women who have been diagnosed with bipolar disorder than men. It's more prevalent in women. Okay. And trauma can cause borderline personality disorders, can't it? No. Never? Right now, we know that there are people who have borderline personality disorder who have sustained childhood trauma. There are also people who have borderline personality disorder who have had no childhood trauma. So like most personality disorders and really like most mental health issues in general, there seems to be both a biological component. In this case with borderline personality disorder, the research tends to support a genetic component and possibly a neurological component. And then there is also possibly an environmental component triggering those genetic markers. Do you know the percentage of women who are victims of IPV, intimate partner violence or domestic abuse, who are diagnosed with borderline personality disorders? I can't tell you the percentage off at the top of my head, but I do know that there is a larger, women with borderline personality disorder tend to have a higher prevalence of being involved in intimate partner violence relationships, being the receiver of violence, and being the perpetuators of violence. Now, you've never been asked to testify or serve as an expert with respect to whether someone has a bipolar disorder. Is that correct? A bipolar disorder? Yes. That's not correct. Okay. Bear with me. Do you have any approach? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, do you recall having your deposition taken in this case? Yes. On March 21, 2022? I believe that was the date, yes. And were you under oath at that time? Yes. All right, I'm going to ask you to turn to page 207. And the question was, have you ever been asked to testify or serve as an expert with respect to whether someone has bipolar disorder? And your answer at that time, will you please read to the jury? I'm sorry, page 207? 207, line five. Ah. Could you No. Read? Okay, thank you. Now, when this designation was served in February of 2021, you had not rendered an opinion that, quote, Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that are consistent with co-occurring cluster B personality disorder traits, especially borderline personality disorder, correct? I'm sorry, I, I missed the first part. What was that? When this designation was served that you have in front of you as plaintiff's exhibit 884, oh, okay. you had not rendered an opinion that, quote, Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that are consistent with co-occurring cluster B personality disorder traits, especially borderline personality disorder, correct? No, I had not rendered any opinions. My opinions weren't finalized until after my evaluation. Right. So when this came out, you had not rendered that opinion? I had not rendered that opinion. Okay. The second opinion that's listed in the February 2021 is that Ms. Hurd repeatedly and characterologically perpetuated severe physical and psychological intimate partner violence, IPV, toward Mr. Depp over the course of their relationship. End of quote. Did I read that correctly? Uh, it says perpetrated, but other than that, yes. Okay. And so it, is it correct that they, that this pleading says in February 2021 that you are going to testify to that? This document, it, yes. yes. Okay. It says and, that. And you have never been asked to testify as to whether anyone has 
behaviorally or characterologically conducted conduct that suggests they may be an IPV perpetrator, correct? I have, to, I have to ask that again because I yes. stumbled. I can't Thank do you. characterologically. That one's just a okay. tough one for me. Okay. You have never been asked to testify as to whether anyone has behavioral or characterological conduct that suggests they may have been an IPV perpetrator, correct? No, I've never been asked to testify for that. Okay. And that was not your opinion in February 2021, correct? No. And in fact, you do not hold that opinion now and you were not even asked to provide such an analysis or opinion. Isn't that correct? No, or that is correct. That's yes. correct, okay. And you have never held that opinion, correct? No, that is correct, yes. Okay. And your third opinion, if we can go to page 14, was that Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that suggest her allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false, end of quote. Do you see that? I see that. You said it's my third opinion. That is not my opinion. All right. But in this pleading, it says that you will testify to that, correct? Yes, that's what this says. Okay. And that was not your opinion in February 2021, was it? No. As I said, I had not formed any opinions at that time. I had just been retained. Okay. And in fact, you have never arrived at this opinion as an expert witness in this case, correct? In terms, no, the opinions that I've rendered are provided in my report. And, you and have, they're what I'm testifying to today. And you have never arrived at this opinion as an expert witness in this case, correct? Objection debated. I, uh, I'll sustain it. You have never arrived at the opinion that Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that suggest her allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false, correct? That's correct. Okay. And in fact, you've said that has never been my opinion, correct? What I'm saying is that this, the opinions in here, I, these are not my opinions. My opinions are provided in my report. Can you please turn to page 255 of your deposition? And if we can start on 254 to give the I context. I don't have that page, I'm sorry. 254, line 11. Oh, okay. And the question is now, the next one is, quote, Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that suggest her allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false, end of quote. Was that your opinion in February 2021? And you answered at that time, no, correct? That is correct. And then I asked, have you ever arrived at that opinion in the time that you have served as an expert witness in this case? And your answer was, could you read that to the jury, please? Yes. Um, so no, it's not the task I was cut off, or I, essentially what I read, I, what I said then was, no, Dr. that's Curry. not the task okay. of DASH. That was never my task to determine. Can I say what that means? No. And then okay. the question is, so is it fair to say that you have never arrived at an opinion that, quote, Ms. Hurd exhibits patterns of behavior that suggest allegations of abuse against Mr. Depp are false, end of quote. And what was your answer? Well, there was an objection. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll read it for you if you're having difficulty. Okay. No, no, your no. answer was under oath, correct. That is not my opinion. That has never been my opinion. Isn't that what correct. you said under yes. oath on March 21st? And then I wrote, do you, then I'm going to ask you, do you know who wrote this portion of the designation suggesting that these were your opinions in February of 2021? And what was your answer? I said no. Okay. Now, as of the time of this initial expert designation, you had not reviewed any materials, re reached any opinions, correct? I believe I had just started to review materials. Um, I, I believe that I indicated that in my deposition. I had not yet rendered any opinions. I uh, had completed my review and I hadn't conducted an evaluation. Okay. And in fact, you've never testified as an expert on IPV, intimate partner violence. Isn't that correct? I believe that is correct, but I may not be remembering all of my cases. Well, let's go to page 200. Okay.
line 17. My question was, have you ever testified as an expert on IPV? And your answer under oath then at line 22 was what? Oh, gosh, let me catch up. Line 22. No. And you've never testified as an expert on emotional distress damages associated with IPV. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you've never been asked to testify with respect to emotional damages associated with domestic violence or abuse. Isn't that correct? Uh, again, that I'm reluctant to say that's correct because with 15 years of experiences, experience, a lot of my cases have been complex and that may have been a component, but I don't remember explicitly a case being just about that. Let's go Correct. to page 199, line 20. My question to you was, have you ever been asked to testify with respect to emotional damages associated with domestic violence or abuse? And your answer under oath at that time was? No. I've not, right? Sorry, isn't that, isn't I haven't found the said? page in time. Okay. You said, no, I've not. But correct? I have not. Okay. Now, you also have never been asked to testify on whether an individual is being truthful in saying that they are a survivor of IPV. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And you have never qualified as an expert to speak to whether a person suffered from IPV, intimate partner violence, or was a victim or survivor of IPV. Is that correct? That's outside of the task of a psychologist to determine whether an event occurred. We assess behavior, we, we assess mental status, we don't detect crimes. So you have not been asked to testify to that, correct? It's not something that occurs, so no, I have not. And you were not ultimately asked to provide any opinions on that, correct? No, I was not. Okay. Now, you did not disclose in any of the designations or your report that you had met with and had dinner and drinks with Mr. Depp, did you? I'm sorry, can you repeat that one more yes. time? Yes, you did not me. disclose in any of the designations or in your report that you had dinner and drinks with Mr. Depp, correct? I did not disclose that I was interviewed by the legal team, no. I asked a different question. Are you trying to resist that you didn't have dinner with Mr. Depp and drinks? I'm not trying to resist that, but it's not quite right. You did have dinner stating. with Mr. Depp, did you not? I did. With and his you had legal drinks team with and Mr. Depp. Depp, did you not? And what? You had drinks with Mr. Depp, did you not? Drinks were served. I. This was over two years ago. I may have had a drink with dinner, yes. In fact, you thought you had a mule something, right? Possibly. Yes, okay. And you didn't disclose that you had met with Mr. Depp, Mr. Waldman, Mr. Chu, and Ms. Vasquez at Mr. Depp's house for three to four hours and had dinner and drinks, correct? I did not disclose that. It's not significant to the report. You don't think that's significant, correct? I don't. Okay. But you've never been asked to meet with a client in his counsel before being retained as an expert, either before or after, have you? No. And you justified that it was okay in this case because it was a high-profile case. That's not quite right. I justified it in this case. Actually, I sought consultation about it. First of all, the person who had retained his attorneys was unable to come to my office with his attorneys. And yes, this is a very visible case. It's been going on a very long time. And I understood that there would be a need to interview me and determine, make an informed decision about my qualifications. Can you look at page 240, please? Line three is my question. Would you agree it's a highly irregular to meet with the subject in a litigation? And your answer on that occasion was, I would not say it's highly irregular. I would say it's not something that I would typically do. However, I had not yet been retained on the case. This was a large, high-profile case, and I understood that I believed that it was appropriate for a person retaining me with such a high profile to meet me, to be able to vet me, essentially with the attorneys present prior to retaining me on his case. Do you recall that? Yes. That's what you said under oath, correct? Yes. And then I said, have you ever done that before? And you said, no. 
correct? correct? And then I said, have you ever done it since? And you said, no, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, would you agree that if you did not find something that would be in favor of Mr. Depp and a negative to Ms. Hurd, that you wouldn't be an expert in this case? That Essentially, I can bring you into court if, you, if you're going to say that Ms. Hurd is right and Mr. Depp is wrong, correct? So, as a forensic psychologist, my obligation is to the court, is to the fact finder. I present science regardless of what that science may be. Now, when I take a case, my retainer agreement is explicit about that, and I D discuss Dr. that Perry, with I'm the just attorneys. Asking you, I'm asking you a question. I'd like you to try to answer okay. my question. You understand that if you found favorably to Ms. Hurd and negatively to Mr. Depp, you wouldn't be here, right? You wouldn't be testifying. Objection and speculation. No, I, oh, okay, sorry. Hold on. The objection is speculation. I, I, that's, that's not speculation. No, I'll sustain the objection if you want to ask. Okay. If, it goes to bias, Your Honor. I sustain the objection. Next question. Okay. All right. You were, in fact, so excited about being involved in this case that you told your husband, even though this was a highly confidential matter, that you were going to be conducting the examination of Ms. Hurd, didn't you? That is not accurate. You not only told your husband, but you told Ms. Hurd that you told your husband, correct? Ms. Bredehoff, that is not accurate. What is accurate? You're incorrect. That is not correct. You, you, is your testimony today under oath that you did not tell your husband that you were going to be conducting the examination of Amber? That is my testimony. Okay. Let's go to page 306. So the question that was asked was because you brought muffins, you said from your husband, right? You get and you gave those to Ms. Hurd, correct? May I clarify what occurred so that we can stop talking about the muffins? What happened was that I was getting ready that morning. I frequently bring muffins to the office. My husband did happen to know that there was going to be a celebrity client coming in because on the mornings that that occurs, which often occurs, we have to actually clear the office and move the staff to the other office. So yes, on the one hand, he was aware of that. I was getting ready. I asked him to go to the bakery near our house and pick up the muffins for me because I was running late. He often has to do that because I often do run late. He brought the muffins back to the house. I brought them into the office. Ms. Hurd and I enjoyed the muffins together. I think I made a comment to her along the lines like, we can thank my husband. He brought or my husband got these for us today, meaning he purchased the muffins. We are now enjoying them because of him. Did, did you say on pages 305 and 306 that you frequently have examinations of high profile clients? You want to just take a quick look and tell us uh, what 305, 306? Yeah, that's where we're talking about it. Is there a line you'd like me to look at? You can start with uh, 15, line 15, 305. Just read through that and tell me whether you said anywhere in there that you have a lot of high profile examinations. You do this frequently. Objection to improper impeachment. I don't agree. I want you to approach, please.
So why did your husband get the muffins for Amber Heard? He did not get the muffins for Amber Heard. He knew you had a high profile client and he was and you were preparing for a very long time and you asked him to pick up the muffins, correct? I asked him to pick up the muffins for me, yes. Okay. Now, would you agree that domestic abuse can be verbal? Absolutely, yes. Would you agree that domestic abuse can be emotional? Yes, certainly. Would you agree that domestic abuse can be psychological? Yes. Would you agree that domestic abuse can be physical? Yes. Okay. Now, you indicated, and I believe you testified in your direct, that it's very important to review the treatment records before forming opinions. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. In fact, that's the first thing you would do, correct? Not necessarily the first, but it's part of the evaluation. Go to page 261. And let's go to 260 because that's where I start the question. The question I asked was, and do you recall whether you'd review any of these by the designation on February 19, 2021? And you said, okay, I can't say for certain. What I can tell you is that knowing my normal procedure, I would have reviewed the treatment records first. Did you testify to that under oath then? Yes. Okay. Now, before we start getting into the ones that you testified about, I just want to be really clear about what you actually uh, have as an opinion with respect to the borderline personality disorder and the histrionics. You didn't diagnose. You didn't. I actually have a DSM-5 diagnosis that Amber Heard suffers from either borderline personality disorder or histrionic personality disorder, correct? That's not correct. Your, in fact, your report says Ms. Heard demonstrates psychological symptoms of a combined borderline and histrionic personality disorder. Would you agree? Yes, I did say that in also what designation was that, I believe, January 18th that report was included yes okay and that's what you said at that time correct yes okay i said a little bit more than that as well you said and i'll read it i'll quote it quote based on the combined results of my interview with ms heard behavioral observations psychometric test data and review of the available records ms heard demonstrates psychological symptoms mm -hmm of a combined borderline and histrionic personality disorder, BHPD. That's yes. what you wrote in your report as one of your conclusions, correct? And that's a DSM-5 diagnosis. And it did not say that you were diagnosing with a DSM-5 for borderline personality disorder or histrionic personality disorder, did it? That's what it says in different semantics. Oh, so, so, so what you meant to it say... It did not use the words you just said. Now, let's talk about the treatment records that you said that you reviewed. But I'm going to start with Rocky Pennington. Your testimony was that out of the blue, Amber hit R Rocky Pennington, correct? I can't remember exactly what I said, but I did reference Ms. Pennington's deposition that Ms. Hurd struck Ms. Pennington in the face. In yes. fact... Ms. Pennington testified that she hit Ms. Hurd, and in response to that, she can't recall, but Ms. Hurd either pushed or slapped her, correct? I don't recall. That's a pretty important distinction, don't you think? My recollection is that there was some sort of violence both ways in the relationship. Either way, it seems that both of them might have been unstable. Uh, oh, I'm we, only evaluating Ms. Hurd. So, so now we have an evaluation of Rocky Pennington? No, from, I just said, but that was not relevant to my opinion because I'm only evaluating Ms. Hurd. But you testified to that on direct that that was a factor, right? Yes. Okay. Well, wouldn't it make a big difference if Amber struck first or just responded back? Given the dynamic, not necessarily. No, it would not have. So, so now you're an expert on Rocky Pennington and her dynamics with a Amber Heard. Objection. I'll withdraw. Okay. So now let's talk about Dr. Cohen. You not only reviewed his treatment records and his text messages and documents, but you also attended his deposition. Did you not? Yes. 
Okay. And do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying that Amber told him about Depp physically abusing her contemporaneous with the events? I don't recall specifically his words, but I remember him recalling that she had disclosed abuse in their treatment, yes. And do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying that he received a text message contemporaneous uh, that Johnny did a number on me tonight. I'm safe in my support tonight, but I need some real help. Do you remember him testifying to that? I don't remember the testimony, but I do remember seeing that text message as one of the exhibits. And do you remember Dr. Cowan testifying that on another occasion, Amber sent him a text, Johnny beat me up pretty good last night, end of quote. Again, I... Not in this constant. She she's, can oh, rely on it. She oh, testified. Over, overrule. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. I didn't need to argue that far, I guess. Do you recall that? Again, I don't recall the testimony, but I do remember that being an exhibit. I've seen it. Do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying that not only did he believe Amber in her reporting of the abuse by Depp, but that she had no ulterior motive? I actually don't recall that. I'm not saying that it didn't occur. Okay. Do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying that he believed the relationship was toxic and he was concerned for Amber's physical well-being. I do recall him saying that he believed the relationship was toxic. And you don't recall Dr. I do not. Cowan saying that he was concerned for Amber's physical well-being? I don't remember those exact words. Do you believe, do you recall Dr. Cowan testifying in that deposition that you were present for, referring to Mr. Depp quote, his controlling nature, jealousy, and suspiciousness, addiction to drugs and alcohol, and violent and indulgent temper. Do you recall him using those terms to describe Mr. Depp? I remember thinking that would be an inappropriate impression for a treating provider of a different person to give, um, but I do recall him making that statement. Do you recall Dr. Cohen testifying that if he pushed her, she was going to push him back? And I never had the impression that she was the provocateur, but that she was indicating to me she had a hard time, you know, de-escalating these types of situations. Yes. Okay. And do you also recall him saying that she didn't say she pushed him, she just said, I got right back up. He told me that, she told me that he pushed her down and she got back right back up. I remember him saying that Ms. Hurd told him that, yes. And do you recall him testifying you could interpret it that way? I kind of interpret it more, you know, metaphorically, that when somebody comes at her, she goes back at them, you know, in a similar way, whether it's verbally or she protects herself. Do you recall uh, that? I, I may, I recall something along those lines, but it was a six or seven hour deposition, so the specifics are not fresh in my mind. Do you recall Dr. Cowan specifically testifying that he believed Amber Heard when she reported the physical abuse by Mr. Depp? I recall him saying that and following it up with a statement that you have to take the patient at their word when you're the therapist. You recall that? Yes. Do you recall him saying he took her, that he believed her? That he found her believable? Yes, yes, that he found her believable. Okay. Um, now, you also testified about Amy Banks. Do you recall that? Yes. And, and before we go there, Dr. Cowan has been a clinical psychologist for 40 years, correct? I'm not sure. Okay. Well, he testified to that, didn't he, in the deposition? I don't recall. And he also saw Amber Heard for over two years, correct? Yes. From 2014, approximately August 2014 to... Uh, 2000 through 2016, correct? Yes, he did. For a period of time, would you mm -hmm. agree? Okay. And he also testified that he did not diagnose Amber with borderline personality disorder. Do you recall that testimony? He also testified that he doesn't use diagnoses, but yes, I do recall that. And do you recall that it was in, th those words were in his notes, but he said he had written that down, but then he discounted it and, and determined that that was not correct for her. Oh, you want to approach? <laughs> All right, now let's jump to Amy Banks.
Dr. Banks is a psychiatrist, correct? Correct. Yes. And in fact, she went to medical school at Georgetown, and she did her psychiatric training at Harvard Medical School, correct? I believe that's correct. I don't recall 100 percent. All right. And she uh, was a psychiatrist in Massachusetts that Amber Heard had reached out to yes. after the Australia incident to try to help her relationship with Mr. Depp, correct? I, I, let me back up. You attended Dr. Banks' deposition as well, did you not? Yes, I did. And Dr. Banks testified to that, correct? Uh, I don't remember if she testified to that. I don't have the notes right in front of me or the deposition transcript. All right. Do, do you recall Dr. Banks testifying that she understood that Amber was in a relationship with Johnny Depp that had gotten violent and out of control? I. I don't recall specifically, no. Do you recall Amy Banks testifying that they had physical altercations and his drug use had escalated and Amber felt she was at risk? I don't recall. Do you recall Amy Banks testifying that Amber was reporting the violence by Mr. Depp and it was not consensual? I recall Dr. Banks stating that Ms. Hurd was reporting violence to her, yes. I do not recall a statement about consent. Do you recall Dr. Banks testifying that there was discussion about Mr. Depp cutting off his finger and she said only that it was a middle of one of these very kind of out of control escalated fights and that did make a fairly big impact on me? I remember something like that. All right. And do you recall that Dr. Banks saying it was a whole other level? As I remember, it told to me he actually cut off a part of his finger during one of these altercations, meaning to me, the way I digested that, if you will, was that things had gotten particularly out of control. I do not recall that exact statement. I'm not saying it didn't occur. I just can't recall it. All right. And you recall that Mr. Depp was in sessions with Ms. Hurd with Dr. Banks, correct? I Yes. Okay. My understanding, however, is that they met with Dr. Banks and then it was primarily Ms. Hurd meeting with Dr. Banks for treatment after prescriptions and therapy. All right. And do you recall Dr. Banks saying that she was not surprised that Amber was seeking a re restraining order because of the violence that she knew existed in the relationship? I do recall that, and it would be impossible to know that violence exists as a treating therapist or as a psychologist. Again, we're not investigators. However, I do recall that she said that because I remember having that thought. And do you recall Amy, and she's a psychiatrist, right? Psychiatrist. So okay. And do you recall Amy Banks saying that it was clear to her that Mr. Depp was the one who initiated the violence? I don't recall that. All right. Do you recall that Dr. Banks said that she knew for certain that Mr. Depp was the one who, who had committed the violence because Ms. Hurd reported it in the presence of Mr. Depp and he did not contradict? I do not recall that. Okay. And do you recall that Dr. Banks ultimately concluded that it was her belief that Amber was a victim of domestic violence at the hands of Mr. Depp? Yeah. Here, you want to approach this? And what was your answer to that last one? I'm sorry. I uh, think I can't recall, but I also can't recall that last question. Do you recall that Dr. Banks concluded that Amber was a victim of domestic violence at the hands of Mr. Depp? I don't recall that. Okay. Now, 
You also reviewed the records of Laurel Anderson and you reviewed her deposition, is that correct? Um, let me uh, refresh my memory for a moment. Uh, um, I reviewed uh, Dr. Anderson's deposition, yes. Okay, and do you recall that she reported that, that Amber Heard had, had reported physical violence by Mr. Depp to her? I recall that she said that Ms. Heard had reported that, yes. Okay, and do you recall that she said that it, it changed over time? I don't recall that specifically. Okay, and do you recall Dr. Anderson saying that she had witnessed her face being bruised after the December 15, 2015 incident? I don't recall that. You don't recall that, okay. Um, and do you recall that Dr. Anderson said that Amber had reported that uh, he had pulled out her hair, bruised her face, kicked her leg, and hit her in the head? Yes, Ms. Heard did report that to her according to her testimony. Okay. And do you recall that Amber Heard said that Mr. Depp was scaring her? I don't recall that specifically. Okay. And do you recall that Dr. Anderson said she believed that Amber Heard was a victim of domestic abuse at the hands of Mr. Depp? I recall, uh, no, I don't recall that statement. All right, let's go to Bonnie Jacob. You said that you reviewed the notes from Bonnie Jacobs, correct? Yes. And what you testified to was that you discounted these because the first notes from Bonnie Jacobs indicated that she already had all of these symptoms, correct? Just, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. I discounted. Tell, tell, tell me why you discounted Bonnie Jacobs' notes. I did not discount Bonnie Jacobs' notes. You said that she, that Bonnie Jacobs, in her notes, had already determined that these symptoms were present for Amber Heard before the relationship with Mr. Depp, did you not? What I recall saying was that within Dr. Jacobs' notes, She's documented instances in which Ms. Heard reported to her over the course of therapy that she was experiencing nightmares, recurrent nightmares, in fact, about childhood abuse. Okay. Now, the very first entry on Bonnie Jacobs' notes, and th these are the notes, right? Do you recognize these? I do. And okay. we received more uh, sort of at the tail end just a couple months ago. All right, so the first of Bonnie Jacobs' notes is on 10-17-2011. Do you recall that? I, I don't recall the exact date. I don't have anything in front of me. And she was already, Amber Heard was already in the relationship with Johnny Depp at this point, was she not? I believe she was, yes. Okay, and in Bonnie Jacobs' notes, she documents, however, oh, go ahead. She documents multiple multiple occasions that Amber Heard reports to her physical violence uh, upon her by Mr. Depp, does she not? There are several notes that indicate that Ms. Heard has reported violence by Mr. Depp, yes. Many, many, correct? I wouldn't qualify it as many, many. I'm not sure what you mean how, by how, many, many. How many would you say? I don't know. I don't have the notes in front of me. Okay. Well, what do you recall in deciding to make your opinions in this case? Well, I'm confused about the dates because I know that Dr. Jacobs treated Ms. Heard even while she was in her prior relationship, leaving her prior relationship with her last wife. Uh, Dr. Curry, I'm not going to ask you to try to bring in extraneous things. I'm asking you what you recall of these But notes. the dates would have been different based on that alone. Okay. And I recall that there was quite a bit of information because these were copious notes spanning back in time from her relationship with Tasha. So, Dr. Dr. Curry... Please answer my question. How many occasions do you recall Dr. I don't know. Dr. Jacobs documenting Amber reporting physical abuse? I don't know. Now, you also said that you listened to audio tapes in this case, correct? Yes. Did you hear Mr. Depp admitting to headbutting Ms. Heard? That is not what I heard. You didn't hear that? I heard a conversation about headbutting. I did not hear him, as you said, admit to headbutting Ms. Heard. Okay, that's your characterization of it, correct? 
Yes. Okay. Um, the, did you see the videotape of Mr. Depp in the kitchen? Yes. Okay. Did Ms. Heard imagine that or create that, or was she responsible for that somehow? Objection. I'll, I'll, I'll sustain the objection. Next question. Okay. Um, what, if any, impact did you have? Did that have on your opinions watching Mr. Depp in that video? I'm not sure. It, it was one of many pieces of the exhibits and other collateral data that I considered. I'm not sure what the direct impact was or if that could be measured. All right. Now, counsel asked you whether you had conducted any type of examination on Mr. Depp, and I believe your answer was no, correct? No. You did not review any medical records or psychological records from Mr. Depp either, did you? I reviewed all of the records that were available. Do, do you recall reviewing medical and psychological rec records I, on Mr. I, Depp? Yes. Do you recall Dr. Blaustein referring to Mr. Depp having rage? No, I actually recall him referring to Ms. Hurd in that note. Your testimony is that Dr. Blaustein was referring to Amber Heard as having rage? I transcribed several of the notes, and I may be missing a time when he I said that about Mr. Depp. The handwriting was very difficult to transcribe, but there was one instance in which I recall transcribing him stating that Mr. Depp reported that Ms. Heard had rage. Dr. Blaustein's deposition was taken, was it not? Uh, I don't recall. Do you recall, uh, so I take it then you don't recall him testifying that Mr. Depp told him he had rage and demons? I don't recall. Okay. Do you recall Dr. Blaustein testifying that Mr. Depp looked at his wife Amber like his mother or his sister that he didn't like? I haven't seen his deposition. I don't recall that. Okay. Now, did you see and do you know whether Mr. Depp has ever been diagnosed with any personality disorders? My, that's not relevant to my task to conduct an evaluation of Ms. Heard. So, so would it, would I, I do not know that he has had one. It was not in the records that he did. All right. So one way or the other, you don't know whether Mr. Depp suffers from any personality disorders. There was, that's not my task. Okay. Let me go to uh, IPV perpetrators. Would you agree that accusations of infidelity can be considered one of the characteristics of a personality perpetrator of IPV? It can be a characteristic of a lot of things. It is something that can be weaponized if somebody is trying to or is having rage toward their partner. Let's go to page 270. Line three, my question was, are accusations of infidelity considered one of the characteristics of a perpetrator, a personality perpetrator of IPV? Objection. The objection. Um, it, the question is, is, is vague and ultimately ambiguous. I, I don't understand the objection. I, I'll overrule the objection. Okay. And your answer under oath Can at you that remind time, me of the page? I thought page 270. Line three was where my question was, okay. and your answer is at line eight. You said it can be, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And interrogating your partner about unfounded accusations of infidelity can be abusive. Would you agree? It can be if they're unfounded, yes. Okay. Um, and psychological consequences for a victim of IPV can include diminished self-esteem, correct? Yes. Depressed mood? Yes. Anxiety? Yes. Fearfulness? Certainly. Diminished self-agency? Yes. Feeling powerless? Yes. Loss of sleep? Yes. And IPV is a traumatic stressor, would you agree? It is. All right, and IPV is capable of resulting in PTSD, is it not? It is. Okay. And IPV is capable of resulting in other trauma-based disorders, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. 
Now, Amber's medical examination, she was cooperative, correct? Her psychological, yes. She okay. was cooperative and polite. Okay. And, and in the two full days of examination, you felt she was polite and answered all your questions, except in one instance where she furrowed her brow when you were asking about friendships in high school, correct? That's not correct. All right, let's go to page 275. So we start on 274 with the, was she polite? You said yes. Was she cooperative? Yes. Uh, did she answer your questions? For the most part, yes. This is uh, now we're on page 275, lines 4 and 5. And then my question was, did she at any time become combat combative or unfriendly with you or angry? And your answer was, there was one instance in which she appeared annoyed and the posturing forward a bit, more assertive tone, furrowed brow, when I was questioning something, following up on data that had been inconsistent about friendships in high school. Other than that, she was very polite. Is that your answer at that time? That was my answer at that time, and it's inconsistent with the question you had just asked me. And would you agree that appearing for this examination with an expert who had been retained by Mr. Depp more than a year earlier might be a little stressful? Yes. Okay. And in fact, not only had you been retained by Mr. Depp, but what had been communicated by Mr. Depp's team was that you had called Amber Heard a liar and a perpetrator of abuse, correct? First of all, I, I'd like to clarify that I was not retained by Mr. Depp. I was retained by Mr. Depp's counsel. And what I can say that, yes, any examinee in a forensic context, you would consider that they're probably stressed. All right. Would you agree that all perpetrators of IPV have anger management issues? Yes. And a large portion of IPV perpetrators have substance abuse issues. Not, uh, it, it's one of many factors that correlates with intimate partner violence, but there are certainly many people who perpetuate intimate partner violence who do not have substance abuse issues. All right, let's go to 131, line 17. One thirty one, you said? Yes, line twelve is what I have here. And I'm talking about you said and just to give context, remember I was asking you how many what percentage of uh, people you treat that are perpetrators and you'd said five percent. Do you recall that just for substance? I see that here. Okay. And then I, then I said um, of the 5% that are IPV perpetrators that you've treated over the last eight years, how many of these perpetrators have substance abuse issues? And your answer was? I see that I answered with a figure of speech, a large portion. Okay, thank you. And it's common for the perpetrator to essentially gaslight the victim, accuse them of being the perpetrator. Are Would you agree? Are you in a different area or are you asking me a separate question? I'm asking question? you a question. Oh, um, and it's common. sorry, can you please repeat it? Yes. And it's common for the perpetrator to essentially gaslight the victim, accuse them of being the perpetrator. Would you agree? That's exactly how it was asked in the deposition. So yeah, I understand. It is a compound question. I'll okay. the objection. And it's common for the perpetrator to essentially gaslight. I don't think that's, Your Honor, it's just, I think it's just one question. Um, <laughs> let me try it. To gaslight the victim, isn't it? That's a characteristic of psychological abuse, yes. Okay, and, and it's common then for them to accuse them of being the perpetrator, the victim. That's a characteristic of abuse from women perpetrated against men. It's actually very, very common. About 90% of male victims of IPV have reported that a female partner who abuses them makes threats to uh, report their partner as an abuser, it's less common for men to make that statement to female partners just because there's less potential consequence. Isn't it true, though, that some form of gaslighting is often present in these personality-based IPV scenarios? Yes. Okay. 
And it's distressing for the victim to be accused, is it not? Absolutely. It causes them a lot of fear? Certainly. And it causes them a lot of distress? Absolutely, yes. And in fact, they feel falsely accused, correct? Yes. And they feel paranoid? Yes. And they feel frightened? Yes. Afraid that everyone's going to believe the perpetrator, correct? Yes. And in fact, they're afraid they're going to lose their security, correct? Can you clarify what you mean by security? I'll ask the next one. And they're afraid they're going to lose their reputation, correct? Yes. Okay. Now let's talk about the testing for a moment. You talked about the MMPI-2, but that's not the most recent MMPI, is it? No, it's the most researched. Okay. Now, you, you need to have an elevated, uh, on the MMPI, there was only one section that had elevated, uh, elevated scores, correct? Mm -hmm. No, that's not correct. It was the K section, correct? That's not correct. Okay. And was there any elevated score over 65 on the MMPI? I would need to take a look at it. If you know, I provided a 25 page interpretation outline. If you're able to pull that up, I'd be happy to go over any of the individual scores for you. Can you recall any clinical scales for the MMP? PI2 for Amber Heard that were above 65 as you sit there today? Again, there are multiple, multiple scales on this test, 25 pages worth listed. So if you can pull it up, then I can review and give you a confident answer. What can you recall as you sit there? I, I'm hesitant to do that because I don't want to make an error by ignoring hundreds of scale scores. And would you agree that you can't make a pathological determination or diagnosis if the scales are not elevated on the MMPI-2? I would not agree with that. Okay. Now, one of the answers that Amber gave is that it's hard for her to feel safe, correct? Uh, what are we, are you talking about the MMPI-2? Yes. Again, I don't recall. There are 567 items on that. I would need to see her results. Well, it's a common trauma symptom, isn't it, to not feel safe? Sure. And safety concerns are common among women who have been victimized, correct? Women and men, yes. Okay. And common especially for sexually victimized people. Would you agree? Any, any type of victimization, yes. Okay. And hard to trust. That's a common after effect of interpersonal violence related trauma, correct? Sure. And memory dif difficulties. Amber said she felt she had holes. Do you recall that? I do. And, and her it, account was different than typical me memory difficulties with trauma. It is, it, it is common for individuals who have experienced trauma. I, and it's actually not have. common. No, it's a symptom, but it's the least common. In fact, a DSM-5 diagnosis for PTSD includes a, quote, inability to remember an important aspect of the traumatic event, end mm -hmm. of quote. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. And memory difficulties are a symptom of PTSD, correct? Certain types of memory difficulties, yes. Okay. Now, do you recall when Amber says the first incident of abuse took place? I believe it was, oh, the first incident in which she, yes, so she stated that it was early on in their relationship. Okay. Do you recall it? Involved? I don't recall the exact date off the top of my head. Do you recall it being a tattoo, something related to a tattoo? I do. Okay. Now, if someone had been subjected to a four-year relationship characterized by repeated IPV, they can have symptoms, correct? Yes. Intense anxiety? Yes, certainly. Depressed or irritable states? Actually, this it's not so much states. When you're looking at a real trauma reaction, it's pretty uh, persistent. It's less of these transient states. Intimate problems? Yes. Relationship difficulties? Yes. And these are symptoms you're also attributing to the personality disorder, correct? Yes, there are some key differences. Okay. 
Now let's talk for a moment specifically about a couple of the uh, profiles on the MMPI. This is not an exaggerated profile for her, is it? No, actually that was something unique. When she completed objective broadband measures where the questions, you, you don't know what the questions are getting at, they seem completely random. She uh, raised scores that indicated that she was trying to minimize any mental issues and, and appear completely free of pathology. When she took tests that asked questions that were specific to trauma, that's when you'd see these extreme exaggerations. All right, let's go to page 337. My question on line seven, this is not an exaggerated profile, is it for her? And your answer under oath at that time was no, it is not an exaggerated profile. Do you see that? Yes, That's we're talking about the MMPI here. You yes. testified under oath at that time, correct? Yes, that's okay. correct. Now, the profile is also not consistent with malingering, correct? The MMPI two profile, it's specific to how she approached this test. And you're correct. For this test, it was a defensive profile, not an exaggerated profile. So my question on line 10 was, this is not a profile consistent with malingering, correct? And your answer under oath at that time was correct. On this test, it is not consistent with malingering, period, right? Yes. That was your full answer. Okay. Now, is it your testimony under oath today that you have not been asked to testify concerning Ms. Hurd's behavior in the context of her relationship with Mr. Depp, including any abuse. That's correct. Okay. And you have not made any determinations, including any uh, of opinions that Ms. Ms. Hurd abused Mr. Depp or Mr. Depp abused Ms. Hurd, correct? Correct, that's outside of the scope of psychology. Okay. And you cannot testify whether Amber Heard suffered any emotional distress as a result of any of the defamatory comments that she has alleged Mr. Waldman made through Mr. M Mr. Depp made through Mr. Waldman, correct? What I can testify is that there was no indication of a decline in psychological functioning showing any injury since she's been with Mr. Depp. You, you cannot testify one way or the other on that, correct? Your Honor, may we approach? Okay. Dr. Curry. Yes. In your report, nowhere in your report did you uh, provide any opinion of whether Ms. Hurd suffered emotional distress as a result of the defamatory statements. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. All right, redirect. Dr. Curry, you were just asked a question about malingering. Yes. And made reference to the MMPI-2. Is there another test that you did to make a determination with respect to malingering? Yes. So I also, well, malingering is a term that most psychologists, we try to be careful of it because it indicates an intent for secondary gain. I prefer feigning, which you had brought up earlier, because it indicates that somebody is intentionally exaggerating, but I don't know necessarily why. 
So I think that's a more accurate term in general. Um, on the MMPI-2, yes, there was no exaggerated profile. I also gave her the, the CAPS-5, I don't know if you'll remember, but that is the clinician-administered PTSD scale consistent with the DSM-5. And on that, there were signs of gross exaggeration. I also um, looked at the test results that were provided by Dr. Hughes. And on an objective test of trauma, um, there is a scale specific to intentional exaggeration on that test. And Ms. Hurd was in the 98th, profile, 98th percentile, meaning that she is, uh, she indicates she had engaged in extreme levels of exaggeration. Thank you. Uh, you were asked about uh, intimacy problems, relationship difficulties associated with IPV, and, and you, you then said that there were some key differences. Yes. What are those? So what you see when we're talking about the personality disorders is there is a very consistent pattern of the aggression, the violence, the irritability. First of all, it's escalated. But second of all, it occurs when there is either, for the borderline component, a threat of abandonment, a perceived slight, feeling like the person is about to leave you, about to walk away to get some space from an argument. It's all, it also occurs to a let, more mild extent, but when there's a loss of attention and a need to manipulate to try to get that attention back, but it's not, when somebody has PTSD, that irritability is sort of at a low, constant level, or it's completely random. For instance, you might have a Vietnam vet who went straight to bars for a period to get into fights with the hope that he would kill somebody and just self-destruct. So it's a very different type of presentation. IPV, it might be more irritability, but that's actually less of a symptom for female IPV victims. Usually what you'll see is somatic symptoms, the depression, a lot of fearfulness and anxiety, but typically more complaints about somatic symptoms. Okay. You testified that uh, some uh, of the professionals involved in this case had to take their patient at her word. What did you mean by that? So when you're providing therapy, you're in a very different role than an examiner. When you're the forensic examiner, you're just really looking at data to make a decision. When you're a therapist, you're an advocate for your client's well-being. And in fact, it's considered extremely unethical for a treating provider to ever provide um, opinion testimony like I'm providing because it's so well known in our field that you're going to have an automatic bias for your client. It's almost a, a sense of protection, advocacy, wanting their best, which is why we also know that it's very inappropriate to um, convey any sort of opinion about whether a crime occurred, whether abuse occurred. We can certainly believe our clients. We can support them in their therapy and take them at their word. But when giving opinions and consultations, we have to be very, very cautious and really only provide the, the facts. We would state things in terms of, my client did report this. I saw this. Here was our treatment plan. Here was the diagnosis. It's, uh, we just, we're taught, we're trained to stay away from making any sort of opinions, understanding that most of the time and most of Ms. Heard's providers were just treating Ms. Heard. They had never so much as done an uh, initial, evalu or initial interview with Mr. Depp and gotten his whole life story or his symptoms or his side of any of it. Um, and they're gonna be advocating and, and the treatment relationship is about helping your client achieve well-being, not making uh, formal psychological or psych psychiatric opinions. So you're asked a, a question about a series of doctors. Dr. Cohen, treating physician? Yes, he was a psychologist. Yeah. Dr. Banks, treating physician? Dr. Banks, yes, treating psychiatrist. Dr. Anderson? Yes, uh, treating psychologist. Every one of them had to take Amber word at, and her at his word, right? Yes. Excuse me. Maybe. Uh, maybe. Oh, overruled. I don't know. Thank you. No further questions. All right. Is this witness subject? Yes, sorry. Uh, is this witness subject to recall? No. Oh, oh, yeah. All right. Since you're subject to recall, Dr. Curry, please do not uh, discuss your testimony with anybody and please do not watch uh, anything of this trial. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You can stay there for a moment. Okay.